Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Arundhati Ramnan and these are the top headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. Sensex and Nifty gain for the fifth straight session despite some wild swings in late trade. Mid-caps underperform. The Indian rupee remains near record low levels against the dollar. Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee to announce its rate decision tomorrow. A CNBC TV18 poll highlights that a majority of the economists do not expect a repo rate cut despite a lower than expected GDP print. Only 50% expect a cash reserve ratio cut tomorrow. Bitcoin crosses $100,000, gaining 140% in 2024 and nearly 50% since Donald Trump's victory. The rally gathered momentum after Trump announced plans to appoint crypto-friendly Paul Atkins as the next chair of the U.S. securities market regulator. Indian corporate sector has never had it so good as it has in the last four years. Now it is time to engage in a good combination of capital formation and employment growth as well. Chief Economic Advisor to the government says corporate profits are up fourfold in four years, but compensation to employees has been weak. Calls on India Inc. to review its hiring process and undertake capital expansion also says deregulation will be the theme of the upcoming econ economic survey. Devendra Fadnavis takes oath as Maharashtra Chief Minister in a grand ceremony at Mumbai's Azad Maidan. Eknath Shinde and Ajit Pawar sworn in as Deputy Chief Ministers. Prime Minister Modi, Cabinet Ministers, Corporate Captains and top film personalities attend the ceremony. Amnesty International says Israel's war in Gaza tantamounts to a genocide. At least 21 people killed after Israeli forces bombed a so-called safe zone in Gaza. India's Foreign Minister Jay Shankar tells the parliament India will continue to support a two-state solution. Also says defence cooperation with Israel is based on national security measures. Brian Thompson, the CEO of United Health Group's insurance business, shot dead outside a New York hotel. He was 50 years old. The police calls it a premeditated attack, but is yet to identify the killer who remains at large. The president of the World Economic Forum, Borhe Brenda, says India is the startup nation of the world, expects Indian economy to remain among the fastest growing in the world. That's an exclusive. International airlines seized the India opportunity even as domestic airlines scramble to increase capacity. Major international carriers increase capacity and frequency of flights from and to India. From food delivery to sporting events to concierge services, Zomato and Swiggy are busy diversifying into new areas, not necessarily, necessarily related to their core business. Will it pay off? A special report coming up. Let's start with the stock market action of the day. Sensex and Nifty gained for the fifth straight session, but it was a wild ride on the last street. Both indices almost spared all the gains in the last hour, but there was a recovery in the last few minutes and both the Sensex and the Nifty ended with gains of a percent. Midcaps and banks relatively underperformed today. From the stock market to the money market, the Indian rupee continues to hover around record lows against the dollar. The Monetary Policy Committee will announce its rate decision tomorrow. What can we expect? Ritu Singh is here with the CNBC TV18 poll. The sharp slowdown in growth has put RBI in a very uncomfortable position. There is a growing chorus for a rate cut, including from government officials, at a time when high inflation, which has now breached RBI's tolerance threshold, continues to be a spot of bother. Now, the CNBC TV18 poll shows that 7 in 10 economists do not expect the lower GDP print to accelerate the rate cut cycle, and they believe the primacy of inflation is going to prevail for now. The MPC is expected to leave the repo rate unchanged at 6.5% for the 11th consecutive policy because of lingering inflation concerns and also because of the volatility in global markets because a rate cut at this point can also accentuate the pressure on the currency. So instead of going for a rate cut, the governor could address the growth concerns with a dovish commentary which will lay then the foundation for a rate cut in the next meeting. In fact, an overwhelming 90% of respondents expect to see the first rate cut from the RBI in the February meeting and the total quantum of rate cuts is seen between 50 to 70 basis points. Now while a rate cut is ruled out with inflation above 6%, there could be an explicit acknowledgement that growth needs support and as a step towards an eventual easing, the RBI instead may go for a CRR or a cash reserve ratio cut. 
but the respondents are pretty divided on the possibility of this happening with only 50% seeing the chance of a 25 to 50 basis point cut which could ease some of the pressure on the banking system liquidity. Now the GDP forecast that is likely to grab all the eyeballs. 70% of our respondents are predicting that the RBI will lower its FY25 growth projection to 64 to 6.7% and 20% foresee a revision all the way down to 6 to 6.3 percent. Now on inflation, half the respondents expect the MPC will revise its projection for FY25 upwards to about 4.8 to 4.9 percent, while 40 percent are expecting a more modest increase. Now, apart from the policy rate decision, the RBI statement is also expected to focus on liquidity management because systemic liquidity has been impacted because of increased forex interventions and the government's cash balances have also been volatile. And so our respondents believe that the RBI will continue to manage liquidity through both main and fine tuning operations. That's as far as the policy is concerned. Of course, the markets also want to see what happens with RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das's tenure, which is supposed to end on the 10th of December. Right, Ritu, many thanks for those details. Now, the Bitcoin has crossed $100,000, gaining 140% in 2024 and nearly 50% since Donald Trump's victory in the, uh, in the recent U.S. presidential elections. With this, the crypto's market capitalization has crossed $2 trillion. Manisha Gupta joins us now with more. Manisha? Well, it's an exciting day, especially for the crypto community, because you have $100,000 on Bitcoin here. It was in 2014 that Bitcoin was at $100. And now in 2024, it's at $100,000. And the markets clearly are coming with very strong, bigger numbers for the next couple of years at this point in time. But with this now, the Bitcoin valuation or the market cap stands at a record $2 trillion. It is the seventh largest asset in the world with this kind of numbers there. If you look at the overall crypto market, the total valuation or the market cap stands at at $3.86 trillion, which also is a record highs. And it's not just Bitcoin which has hit an all-time highs. You have other more scalable platforms like a Solana or a Ripple, which also have hit an all-time highs. So in this year, while the Bitcoin has gained up by 140%, you have Ether up by 70%, Ripple is up to 82%, Solana up 131%. And it is uh, the case, really, many of these cryptocurrencies are up in triple-digit percentage for 2024. The latest run-up comes in after the U.S. president-elect has named cryptocurrency advocate Paul Atkins as the SEC chairman. This is after Gary Gensler is offered to step down in the month of January. Apart from that, uh, the Trump, uh, the whole uh, demeanor comes in as crypto-friendly president that in any case has been supporting many of these cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. The other few factors which also have been supportive in this year especially is one, it's a Bitcoin halving year that has always been a support. And then the U.S.-based spot uh, ET which was launched in January 2024 has accumulated $30 billion within its uh, as a program. The markets also are looking at a lot of corporate adoption, institution buying as well. Mutual funds have been buying it for their uh, clientele as well. That has been supportive. And uh, the latest has been the Russian president saying that you cannot ban cryptocurrencies. The Russian president also, by the way, has signed a law classifying digital currencies as a form of property in foreign trade settlement under an experimental legal thing. Uh, with the kind of numbers that we're looking at, the markets do believe that 2025 could be a replica of what we've done in this year till now. So cryptos, they're seeing a record-breaking rally. Thank you so much for those details, Manisha. Now, moving on, a thrust on deregulation, a nudge to India Inc. to pay more and invest more, and a word of caution against over-interpreting the GDP data. CEA Ananta Nageswaran's remarks at an ASOCAM event served as a clarion call to the industry to hike their CAPEX budget. Nageswaran urged the industry to review their hiring processes and undertake capital expansion. He said that corporate profits are up fourfold in four years, but compensation to employees has been weak. The CEA also stressed that India Inc. should adopt the mantra of maximizing rather than optimizing when it comes to R&D budgets. The CEA said that India's underlying growth story remains intact amid global uncertainties and cautioned against over-interpreting the Q2 growth data, which at 5.4% was lower than expected. He said, and I quote, we should not throw the baby out with the bath water. Ananta Nageswaran also said deregulation would be a major theme in the upcoming economic survey, slated to be released a day prior prior to the tabling of the union budget. The staff costs of private listed companies, whether it is information technology firms or general, has been coming down. In other words, compensation growth has been become weaker and weaker. Compensation to employees.
employees. And if you take out managerial compensation, this will look even more uh, uh, acute, the, the decline. And of course, corporates have used the profits to uh, uh, reduce their leverage, which is a good thing. They are deleveraged, their balance sheets are healthy. The focus has to be on this, the plumbing of deregulation that has to happen in state and local governments. We touched upon it quite a bit in the economic survey in July, and that is going to be the big theme. Deregulation or letting go is the big theme for the coming economic survey as well. And this is an example. If Indian businesses have to comply with all the rules for building guidelines, small and medium enterprises may not even have one percentage of land available for actual production. India's research and development expenditure as a percentage of GDP is one of the lowest in the world. This is a dimension of where the tyranny of the small size is it's still, still there with us. And if we have to raise our manufacturing share of GDP to 25% or, or, or more, and be embedded in global supply chain, we have to learn from the successes of Germany, Switzerland, and Japan, which is to increase what we call this proportion of small and medium enterprises, which in the German language is called the Mittelstand. And to the big national headline, Devendra Farnavis took oath as the Chief Minister of Maharashtra close to two weeks after the BJP Shiv Sena NCP alliance registered a landslide victory in the assembly polls. The grand swearing in ceremony took place at Mumbai's Azad Maidan with Prime Minister Modi top central ministers in attendance. Eknath Shinde and Ajit Pawar took oath as deputy chief ministers. While the reappointment of Ajit Pawar was a certainty, Shinde kept the suspense going into the last hour. The swearing in ceremony was a show of strength for the BJP led NDA as well. Prime Minister Modi, Home Minister Amit Shah and top cabinet ministers were in attendance. Chief ministers of NDA rule states attended the ceremony as well. Business leaders and Bollywood personalities graced the event. Reliance chairman Mukesh Ambani, Aditya Birla group chairman Kumar Manglam Birla attended the oath ceremony as well. Sachin Tendulkar, Shah Rukh Khan, Madhuri Dixit were all a part of the guest list as well. Devendra Sarita Gangadhara of Adlavis, Ishwar Shaksha Shakat Bhetoki, Mi Maharashtra Rajyacha Mukhya Mantri Mbhul, Maji Kame, Vistha Purwa, Vasatsar Vivek Buddhu Ne Par Pari, Mi Ekna Gandhubai Sambhaji Shinde, Ishwar Shaksha Shakat Bhetoki, Mi, Mi Ajit Ashatai Anantrao Pawar, Gambiriya Purwa Pratitna Kartoki, The Council of Ministers of Jharkhand government led by Hemant Sorain took oath today. This comes a week after Sorain took oath as the 14th Chief Minister of the state. Of the 11 MLAs who took oath as ministers, six of them are from Jharkhand Mukti Morcha, four ministers are from Congress and one from the RJD. The winter session of parliament continues to see disruptions in both Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. Opposition benches engaged in sloganeering and staged a walkout marking recurrent adjournments on the ninth day of the session. Opposition MPs also carried out demonstrations outside the parliament over the Adani issue and raised demands of a joint parliamentary probe over the recent bribery allegations. Zomato and Swiggy are attempting to move beyond food delivery and quick commerce. Both companies are aiming to diversify into new areas. Will it pay off? Shilpa Rani Peta is here with more. From food delivery to events to concert services, Swiggy and Zomato are busy diversifying into new areas and not necessarily related to their core businesses. Let's look at Swiggy first. What started as a food delivery platform entered quick commerce with Instamart in 2020 and dining out via the dine out acquisition in 2022. But the most recent foray is into sports and recreation through a new subsidiary that will be engaged in sports team ownership, management, talent development, acquiring, broadcasting and sponsorship. 
ownership rights. Now, this subsidiary is in the process of being incorporated. But in this direction, Swiggy has already dipped its toes into the pickleball craze, acquiring Team Mumbai for the inaugural season of the World Pickleball League. Now, diversification of sports in India and commercialization of all kinds of leagues has made sports a big business opportunity. A Fiki report pegs the India sports industry to be a $100 billion market by 2027, of which the sports media market alone is estimated to be $13.4 billion. But it's not just this. It is also testing a service marketplace called Yellow, where you can connect with lawyers, therapists, fitness trainers and other such professionals, and also a premium membership called Rare that gives you exclusive access to high-end events. Now let's look at what Zomato is doing. Zomato started originally as a food discovery platform, but today it has food delivery, quick commerce, hyperpure, and more recently going out. Zomato's big foray was into events recently. Now it has launched a new app called District that allows users to book tickets for movies, live performances, etc., taking on Book My Show. Now this is also a fast emerging space in India as the country's youth are now prioritizing experiential spending. Just look at the craze that we saw for a Jeet, a Dua Lipa, and the upcoming Coldplay concerts. No surprising that not surprising then that even the live events market in India is projected to reach $143 billion by 2026, and Zomato expects the gross order value of its going out business to be over 10,000 crore in FY26. Now, beyond this, Zomato is also pi uh, piloting a concierge like service and is also set to enter at home services via Blinkit, and this will take on Urban Company. But are Swiggy and Zomato making the right bets or are they biting off more than they can chew? Well, experts say that businesses like Swiggy and Zomato need to continuously innovate because rapid growth in delivery might eventually taper off as the business matures. Analysts actually see a huge upside to Zomato's foray into events, which is a supply constraint space that presents a massive opportunity for growth. But how Swiggy and Zomato navigate these new businesses while also maintaining a sustainable and profitable growth trajectory will be key. Right, Shilpa, many thanks for those details. But on that note, it's time for us to head into a short break. But coming up, international airlines seize the India opportunity, even as domestic airlines scramble to increase capacity. Details on the other side. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour. In international news, Israeli forces have reportedly bombed a safe zone in southern Gaza near Khan Yunus, which led to the killing of over 20 people and leaving dozens injured. Further, three people were killed in central Gaza after Israeli forces struck a camp. Meanwhile, Israeli forces continue to strike southern Lebanon despite its ceasefire agreement with Hezbollah. Amnesty International has alleged that Israel's war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip amounts to genocide under international law in its latest report. This is the first such determination by a major human rights organization in the 14-month-old conflict. The report states that the Israeli military was, has committed at least three of the five acts banned by the 1948 Genocide Convention. This includes indiscriminate killings of civilians and inflicting conditions to physically destroy Palestinians. External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar has reaffirmed India's long-standing support for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Speaking in the Rajya Sabha today, Jay Shankar called for the establishment of a sovereign, independent and viable Palestinian state alongside Israel. We support a two-state solution uh, and we have been uh, public and unambiguous about that. We, sir, condemn terrorism, we condemn hostage-taking, we do believe countries have a right to respond to these situations, but countries should be mindful of civilian casualties. They must observe humanitarian law. And we would like a ceasefire and an early end to violence. Our position has been very, very clear. But we would like this duly reflected in well-worded resolutions, which are balanced. And for the first time after six decades, a French government has collapsed. This after Prime Minister Michel Barnier was ousted in a no-confidence vote. Opposition moved the no-confidence motion following Barnier's fa failed attempt to push for a budget without voting. A total of 331 lawmakers voted in favour of the motion. The left-wing alliance and the far-right supported the motion to oust Barnier.
Brian Thompson, the CEO of United Health Group's insurance business, has been shot dead outside a New York hotel. The police has said that the attack was premeditated, but it is yet to identify the killer who remains at large. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos expects a more friendly regulatory environment in the incoming Trump administration. Speaking at the New York Times Deal Book Summit, Bezos said that he would like to help Trump reduce regulation. Trump and Bezos once shed strained ties in the past, but have buried their differences since then. We are burdened by excessive permitting and regulation. You can't build a bridge and all these things. You know what they are. We see these examples all the time. We need to be able to build solar fields but and everything your, else. But so you're optimistic, I'm super about, optimistic. about this president. And the reason I, I ask I'm is because... I'm very optimistic that, that President Trump is serious about this regulatory agenda. Right. And I, I think he's going to... I think he has a good chance of succeeding. And speaking at the same event, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai dismissed criticism by rivals of the company's leadership in artificial intelligence. Pichai also said that AI development will get much more steeper in 2025. At the same event, OpenAI co-founder and CEO Sam Altman said that the role of AI agents will become more imminent in 2025. Agents are the thing everyone is talking about, I think, for good reason. You know, this idea that you can give an AI system a pretty complicated task, like a kind of task you'd give to a very smart human that takes a while to go off and do and use a bunch of tools and create something of value. Um, that's the kind of thing I'd expect next year. And that's like a huge deal. The current generation of LLM models are roughly, you know, a few companies have converged at the top. But I think we're all working on our next versions too. I think the progress is going to get harder. When I look at 25, the low hanging fruit is gone. You know, the, the curve, uh, the, the hill is steeper. I think the LE teams will stand out in 25. Uh, so I think it's an exciting year from that perspective. The president of the World Economic Forum, Borre Brenda, says India is the startup nation of the world. Speaking to Shireen Bhan, he said the Indian economy is expected to remain among the fastest growing in the world. Take a look. What is really exciting is that uh, India is uh, almost becoming the startup nation <laughs> of the world. So there are 140,000 startups here, and that's the third largest amount in the world. We also have a lot of unicorns, mm -hmm. more than 100, and I think there's like a new unicorn every 20th day or something. Many of the companies that are most worth have the highest market cap today didn't exist 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So I'm very optimistic about the entrepreneurial culture mm. and the startup culture uh, in India. Overall, mm. our economists also believe that growth will go up again mm. a bit in India, provided that there will be reforms. And we still do expect that India will be the fastest growing of the large economies, both this year and next year. Mm. For India, I still think, though, that the biggest strength of, of India uh, is the fact that where the demand is really increasing is on services and digital trade. And there, uh, India has a uh, comparative uh, advantage. India's aviation market is booming. Daily passenger traffic has hit a record 5 lakhs and a lot of these passengers are flying to foreign destinations. Indian airlines are scrambling to increase capacity to match this growth. But CNBC TV 18's Madiha Mujawa reports that they will have to open their throttles since global airlines are beating them to the punch. Airports in India are never empty. It doesn't matter whether it's a weekday, the weekend, morning, noon, evening or late at night. And a large portion of these travellers are looking beyond domestic destinations. Between April and June 2024, India saw over 1.76 crore international air passengers travelling to and from the country. That's 13% more than a year ago. The Gulf and Southeast Asian regions have seen the highest demand and Dubai tops the list of most visited destinations, followed by Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Thailand and Qatar. It's not just leisure travel that's driving traffic. Indians are wanting to explore the world, travel to countries they had never been to before and take up career opportunities outside the country. 
and then India's growing popularity in the world has got more foreign nationals visiting the country in the last few years. This has led to a growth in international air travel demand. While Indian carriers are expanding the network to other countries, foreign airlines are deploying more capacity on Indian routes, like launching new routes and also increasing the frequency on their existing routes like Delhi and Mumbai. Currently, 75 foreign carriers operate flights to and from India. And these are all increasing flight frequency and connecting new Indian cities on their routes. Currently, we're providing 6,400, over 6,400 seats per month. And then by adding the Mumbai, we're adding 13,000 per month also. Next year, hopefully that uh, we have opportunity to go to like um, the top city in India, which is Delhi. We are adding a lot of capacity. We have now 11 destinations in India. We have 175, which is 25 flights per, per day, right? 175 per week. We can't grow anymore in, in 2025, but we, we have no doubt, right? We, we want to grow more. Total, the market is roughly 1,000 passengers every day, depart from Mumbai to UK. Um, on all airlines in total, um, and then roughly 2,000 passengers every day travel from Mumbai to United States. So in total, you could say the addressable market is roughly 3,000 people every day. With, the, with these increases, we can have 15% of our total capacity is on Indian routes. For us, you know, India is one of the few markets where we're bigger today than we were pre-pandemic, and mm. we were very quick to expand beyond where we were. Mm. When we look at the fleet order, India is very much one of the markets that shapes uh, what aircraft we buy and how many. These 75 foreign airlines service 54% of India's international passenger traffic. However, there are only seven Indian carriers flying internationally. These include Air India, Indigo, Vistara, Akasa Air and Spicejet. All of these are also in the race to expand their fleets, increase seat capacity and add new international routes and destinations to their network. But here, they face a tough challenge. Incumbent foreign airlines are already flying a larger fleet of bigger aircraft and are better connected. And while Indian airlines have ordered new aircraft to build out their fleets as quickly as possible, a new aircraft takes at least a year to be inducted. And this means the going is slow. In Mumbai, Madiha Mujawar. And with that, it is a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Many thanks for watching, but stay tuned. News continues right here on CNBC TV 18.